Robinson Crusoe is a novel which is sometimes nowadays denigrated as uh, being rather insubstantial. It's sometimes treated as a rather puerile adventure story, suitable for adolescents perhaps, but not having much in the way of literary substance. And I'd like to try and argue against that proposition today. I'd like to try and show that Robinson Crusoe is, first of all, the first of the great English novels, but second of all, and I think this is very important, I guess it's the crux of my argument, I'd like to say that it offers us a way of looking at the Enlightenment, or rather that Robinson Crusoe is a sort of epitome of the Enlightenment project, an epitome of the way the culture of Western Europe in the beginning of the 18th century looked at nature and the rest of the world. And if, in fact, uh, Defoe does that in the course of a 200 or 250 page novel, it is a great literary achievement. And whatever crude, uh, crude qualities we may find in the plot and difficulties we may find in his diction, to encapsulate and epitomize an entire intellectual trend in one work of fiction is a great intellectual achievement, independent of any of its other literary merits. Now, one way of thinking about Robinson Crusoe is to say that it represents the construction of a new hero for a new time. He uh, was published in 1719, and at that time, English commercial capitalism was perhaps the most important economic force in the world. England was becoming extremely wealthy. This wealth had the f quality of changing social relations, changing society, and in particular, it raised new questions about how human beings are going to relate to each other, how they're going to relate to nature, and how they should think about their new condition. If you think about the history of Western literature, you might say that the Homeric hero is a perfect epitome of the kind of the mindset and the um, thought about society and virtue that's characteristic of ancient Greece. I think it would be equally true to say that the otherworldly medieval saint or the kind of um, the strenuous and strict pursuer of Christian virtue would be characteristic of the Middle Ages. Uh, you could think of every man, the, the morality play every man, as instantiating what the, uh, the good or virtuous person of the Middle Ages strove for, and that would be a sort of literary representation of that. I'd like to say that Robinson Crusoe represents the Enlightenment man, and I would use the term man specifically. It's meant to, sp to refer directly to males, and I'll try and explain why it's specifically Enlightenment man that's talked about here. Um, let's think about the Enlightenment to put this into context. There are at least two fundamental themes to the Enlightenment, to the Age of Reason, which happens roughly speaking between oh, 1600 and 1800 in Western culture. The first of the main themes of the Enlightenment is the domination of nature. Newtonian mechanics, uh, the development of modern natural science was at the foundation of Enlightenment thought and the breakthroughs made by Enlightenment <coughs> thinkers. In some respects, all the other activities of culture, uh, social thought, political theory, and literature as well, is in some ways beholden to the development of modern natural science. At the marrow, or at the core of the Enlightenment, we have a new relationship with nature, a relationship which allows people that understand this new science to manipulate and dominate nature for their own purposes. So the manipulation and domination of nature is one of the fundamental characteristics of the Enlightenment, and amazingly enough, it'll turn out to be one of the fundamental characteristics of Robinson Crusoe. Point number two, a second main theme in the Enlightenment is the relationship with other cultures, particularly non-Western cultures. The Enlightenment comes in the wake of the age of exploration. It is founded on the development of science and technology. And in the process of exploring the rest of the world and exploiting the rest of the world economically, the existence of cultures that don't know Christianity, that have completely different orientations towards the world or towards nature or towards society, posed a certain kind of problem for Western culture. How will Western man think about the other? How will he think about what are described as savages? Well, Robinson Crusoe epitomizes that problem and articulates some possible responses to that problem. So the argument that I want to make here, essentially, first of all, is that Robinson Crusoe is Enlightenment man. And the process of Robinson Crusoe's coming to dominate nature and coming to dominate the other natives that he finds on his island or that he has contact with on his island is a sort of allegory about the relationship between Western culture and, first of all, nature, and second of all, other societies. It's this allegorical element or allegorical kind of marrow 
to Robinson Crusoe that I think makes it a great novel. Now, if you think about what Robinson Crusoe does in the, uh, when he's on the island, what you'll find is that he goes through all the stages of uh, technological and cultural development, and he does it as an individual rather than as a society. In other words, he's shipwrecked with nothing. And then he starts from ground zero, think of that as being natural man, which is perhaps the most important concept in the political theory of the Enlightenment. Natural man thrust into the state of nature, forced to manipulate nature in order to satisfy his needs. That's exactly characteristic of Robinson Crusoe. Uh, Plato in the Republic uh, said that the city is like the man, or that the individual is like society, that there's some sort of isomorphic relationship between the qualities and properties and development of the individual and the society as a whole. Well, what I'd like to suggest is that Robinson Crusoe's career on the island, his relationship with nature and his coming to dominate nature through the use of reason, which is always capitalized in this novel, incidentally, which tips you off to something important. His use of reason and is coming to dominate the less developed people that he encounters is a sort of allegory about the way the West dealt with the rest of the world. His process then is our process. What I'm saying here is something like this, that Robinson Crusoe offers us a new hero for a new age. Not like the medieval saint, not like the ancient Greek Homeric hero. Robinson Crusoe is a hero of productivity He's a hero of prudence, a hero of development, or if not just development, a hero of diligence. All these things are usually not associated with a hero. You can't, it's hard to think of someone like Achilles plowing. It, it seems rather unheroic. It's hard to think of one of the great medieval mystics being concerned with growing barley and rice. Remember what Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. Who cares if you have something to eat as long as you're having ecstatic visions? Well. It doesn't work that way for Robinson Crusoe. He doesn't have much in the way of ecstatic visions. He occasionally has the fearful dream, but he lives in a very natural world, and he is a very practical man. Uh, one of the reasons why Karl Marx hated this book so much is that it is such an English book. Particularly, it, it epitomizes English society at the time of commercial capitalism. Robinson Crusoe is unrelentingly acquisitive at the same time he is also uh, deeply religious, not at the beginning of the book, but by the end of the book. So in some respects, you can say that Robinson Crusoe not only exemplifies and epitomizes enlightenment man, you might want to say that he brings together and marries two intellectual traditions which are foundational to, we to Western culture, the tradition that comes out of Athens and the tradition which comes out of Jerusalem. And these two traditions are married together in a rather uneasy alliance, as we will see when we look at the plot of the novel. So there's a lot going on philosophically in this novel. In other words, it's not just a novel for adolescent boys. Now, Rousseau thought, I mean, I don't know if any of you know Rousseau's novel, The Emile. Well, in The Emile, he is writing about the topic of education and how it is possible to educate a young man in such a way that society doesn't corrupt him. And above all, it's very important that we keep him away from books, except one book, Robinson Crusoe. In other words, Rousseau, writing at the middle of the 18th century, thinks that Robinson Crusoe is not just one of the great works of Western literature, but also that it's one of the very, very few that does not corrupt youth. And my suspicion is that he thinks so because it epitomizes all these important tendencies in Western culture. And it leaves out extraneous things that might tempt a young man to go astray. So let's look at, at the, the structure of the novel itself, now that we know what's going on. In other words, I'm trying to argue that this is what the real philosophical import of this novel is. And that to read it just as an adventure story is fine when you're 15, but if you go back and read it at 30, you'll see something totally different. Maybe that's true of all novels, I'm not entirely sure. First of all, let's think of the characters. Now, what, one of the nice things about Crusoe is that there's not many people there. And it's easy to talk about who does what. It's not like doing War and Peace, where you spend all day talking about who does what to whom. The same sort of problem we get with Cervantes. Here, we have a very small number of characters. First and foremost, the most important character in this novel is God. I know that may sound very strange, since he never appears and never says anything. But it turns out that from the perspective of Defoe, God is the strong, silent type. In other words, God is always present, and he is always running the world in his providential way for his providential reasons. And as the character of Crusoe develops, his relationship with God changes, and he becomes something like Job. In other words, God's faithful servant who accepts whatever providence dishes out and ultimately reconciles himself to the idea that God, being perfectly just, does things for his own inscrutable reasons. 
So God is very important in this novel. And it's not just any God. In other words, I've often thought that Christianity has a, such a long and varied history that there are many Christians who worship different gods or have different conceptions of what the deity is. And the deity of Robinson Crusoe is nothing like the deity of, say, the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, when God uh, somehow reveals himself to an individual. It's in the form of ecstatic visions. Think of someone like uh, or Saint Teresa of Avila or any of the great mystics of the Christian tradition. When God appears, it's always some sort of ecstatic vision, some sort of illumination which is direct and powerful, something like uh, the, the night of fire that Pascal had that I'll talk about in another lecture. Direct, immediate, profound, and yet metaphysical apprehension of the divine mind. Crusoe's God is nothing like that. Crusoe's God is a very practical God. Crusoe's God is a very useful God. It's the kind of God that would be invented by a bourgeois Englishman in the middle of the, of the development of, of uh, commercial capitalism. He's the God that sends good stuff. He's the God that rewards diligence, that rewards prudence, that rewards hard work. His God is a kind of celestial foreman. He supervises what you do. He doesn't say anything so long as you work real hard. And when he reveals himself, you don't get a vision of Jesus on the cross. You don't get a direct, uh, direct information from angels. When God reveals himself to Robinson Crusoe, he does so in the form of barley. Rice is the way God reveals himself in this novel. And you can see in some ways why Marx hated this novel so much. What is a more crass, or in some respect more this worldly interpretation of what divine providence amounts to than the fact that barley sprouts. There's a long, rhapsodic treatment of the development of barley in the middle of this book, which is altogether too long, but it seems appropriate to Defoe because his God is a very practical thing. If God didn't give you stuff, I'm not so sure that he'd be all that religious. But the fact that God reveals his will through the sprouting of rice and through the growing of barley accidentally there's a long passage in which, in which uh, Robinson Crusoe comes to know that, yes, God is supervising all the things that have happened to me, all the chastisements that I've gotten I've deserved because of my evil. Here also we'll find that Crusoe's, uh, Crusoe's God is not the inscrutable God of Job. If you remember the book of Job, when God sends bad stuff to Job, it's for no good reason, and that's part of the point. You know, God knows what he's doing and you don't, and that's the way the world is. Sometimes Crusoe does uh, connect himself to Job. He, he takes uh, sections out of the book of Job. He talks about theodicy a great deal. And in addition, he also tries to figure out why God would do this bad stuff to him. He, see, he thinks he's a nice guy. And some of the explanations that he gives, that is to say, God has sent uh, these evils and these chastisements to him on account of his sins and on account of his, uh, uh, his uh, transgressions. Well, he thinks that that's really what God does. In other words, God's not entirely inscrutable. You can see that because of my sinful nature, he's done this to me. And we'll talk about the, the problem of theodicy in this novel because it's an important issue in English literature, at least since the time of Milton, and it's an important issue in Western culture, at least back to the book of Job. Here we have a rather crass and materialistic interpre interpretation. God is up to a point predictable and comprehensible, and the only misfortunes that come into the world are supervised and ordained by God, but always for a reason and usually accessible to the sort of person that has the sort of religious inclinations of Crusoe. Now, so we have a very practical, useful God here, the God that helps us out with agriculture and things like that. The second most important novel is Crusoe, or second most important character is Crusoe himself. Now, Crusoe is a very unattractive person. I mean, I don't know how many of you have read this novel, but one of the reasons why Marx disliked it so much is that he seems to have almost nothing in the way of personality. In the first place, he is a, a good instantiation of what the economists, like Adam Smith later on in the century, would call homo economicus. He lives in order to consume stuff, and he lives in order to acquire things. He spends the whole novel acquiring stuff, even stuff that he has no practical use for. Why? He likes acquiring things. It is a very 18th century British novel in that respect. In other words, the, if you can mention the caricature of the kind of swinish, consuming Englishman, the, the kind of person who's orga, who, who's enti whose entirety of their thoughts are organized around uh, the problem of acquiring and consuming, acquiring and consuming, I think you have a pretty good read on Robinson Crusoe. If you look back at the philosophy of Hobbes, 
who says that human beings are essentially automata that go and try and, so, and, and satisfy their desires in, as, as best they, they can and as often and thoroughly as they can in the course of their encounter with nature. That would be a good way of thinking of Robinson Crusoe. The difference between st a strictly economic interpretation of Crusoe or a strictly Hobbesian interpretation of Crusoe is that you might say that Robinson Crusoe is economic man with a profound religious neurosis. Because not only does he have to consume stuff, but he's obsessed with the problem of how to justify himself, how to find out why it is God does this stuff to him, because God's is, existence is never doubted. All right, that's the, the kind of portion of this that comes from Jerusalem. And in addition, he somehow feels a sense of guilt, the weight of sin, even when he's doing wrong intentionally. The sin or the idea, the misgivings about his motivations, misgivings about his moral status are in the novel from the very beginning. Right? As a matter of fact, he, doesn't, he only goes to sea against the advice of his father, and later on he calls that his original sin. Right? The, the allegory is quite transparent there. Uh, in addition to being a kind of acquiring, acquisitive, consuming sort of figure, um, Robinson Crusoe is unimaginably cold. He is perhaps the least emotional figure to, uh, uh, central to any novel in the Western tradition. I can't think of anyone with less emotion. And I'll try and give you examples of the hard-heartedness of this guy um, it, when I talk about the plot of the novel. But he seems to have nothing in the way of human emotions. He spends 28 years on a deserted island, and you know, towards the end of it he gets Friday and encounters the savages and the various kind of castaways, but at least for the first 20 years or so, he's entirely alone. And he, never talk, he doesn't really talk very much about loneliness. He doesn't seem to fall into despair. You don't get much in the way of emotional reactions. His uh, journal, what he writes about himself and what he says about himself in the course of the novel are things like, started sowing for the field today, or started domesticating goats last month, things like that. And the whole of the novel, his whole 20 years of being alone, are essentially about, A, his relationships with nature and how he comes to dominate nature to get the things that he wants, and B, his religious neuroses and why he's finally realized that God did this bad stuff to him. He really feels sorry for his sins. So apart from that, he seems to, to simply lack the usual complement of human emotions. He doesn't have sex for years and years, and you don't notice any problem there. Um, he does finally get married at the end of the novel, in like, roughly speaking, the last page. And you don't even meet his wife. I mean, she just comes in, they get married, they have some kids, and then he takes off again. So they can write the sequel, so that Defoe can write the sequel to the book. I'm not joking, that's exactly what happens. He comes in, stays about five months, and says, you know what I want to do? I want to go to sea. And you've got to think, that's crazy. You just got married to a woman that doesn't get introduced into this novel, because she's really peripheral to this novel, as all women are. I'll try and explain why. And he doesn't seem to have anything in the way of emotional attachments. Does he fall in love? Well, he doesn't talk about love. He talks about commerce. And that, in some respects, makes him a kind of parody, almost, of the perfect Enlightenment figure. He's not only a rationalist and an empiricist and a, a manipulator of nature, but his emotions are regulated and restricted to the point of sterility. I mean, there's nothing like him for just total lack of emotion. I, I know that the last lecture was on Julian Sorel, and this guy is nothing like Julian Sorel. He's not a heroic emotional figure. Now there are two, uh, actually, there's one other no uh, figure in the novel. And this one other figure is repeated endless times. That's the savage, capital T, capital S. In other words, savages don't have a great deal in the way of personality, at least not in this novel. Why? Well, think about the way Western culture, at the height of its imperialistic ambitions, viewed the rest of the world. There's us, and there's the savages. But fortunately for us, there are two different kinds of savage. There's savage number one who's in this case named Friday. And savage number one is the good savage, capital G, capital S. And the good savage is the kind of savage that wants to become your butler. In other words, a good savage is somebody that wants to be economically exploited, wants to learn Christianity, and wants to follow you around and carry your clothing. Right? It's somebody that naturally says, well, yes, I'd like to enslave myself to you. Thank you for saving me from, from cannibalism. Right? That's the good savage. That's the Western Europeans' idea of a tractable, civilizable, educable savage. And all the other savages in the world are the bad savage, capital B, capital S. And the bad savages are all cannibals and should all be killed. And they are. And doesn't that really encapsulate the entire process of Western genocide? Think about it. It's a justification of slavery. It's a justification of wars of oppression. It's a justification of colonialism and imperialism. And this is not just taken 
I mean, off the cuff. Th think of what of the place and time we're, we're talking about here. This is 1719 when the book is published, and we're in England. They have an enormous commercial empire, and they've met good savages and bad savages, and the good savages became butlers, or one way or another, economically exploited by the English, and the bad savages have to be killed because they're cannibals, and they won't accept Christianity, and they deserve to be killed. Get the idea? In other words, it is a microcosm of the Western Europeans' connection with nature and connection with other societies. So we got good savages and we got bad savages. And that's all the people in the novel, very few. Okay. Now, let's think about the novel itself. There's a saying in biology that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Now, I know that that's a kind of a deep set of words. It, it doesn't mean a great deal beyond this. That in the process of coming into being, an individual specimen will go through all the stages of development that the species had gone through. Usually it's referred to when you look at human fetuses. Uh, at the second month, the fetus has a tail. Back to our simian or canine ancestors, I don't know what the actual isomorphism is. At some level of development, the fetus has gills. I assume that's back to the fish or whatever it is, kind of animals that have gills. In other words, in the process of coming into being, each individual person has to recapitulate the entire history of the species. And that is what this novel is about. That's the plot. What does he do? Well, let's just start from the beginning. He's with his dad. Now think of God the Father as dad. And dad says, stay home, son. Stay home, live the middling sort of life. Don't try to be an aristocrat because you're not. Don't try to be imp impoverished because then you're impoverished. Best thing you can do is stay home here. I'll give you a comfortable existence. And we're here in the Garden of Eden, unless I'm mistaken, which turns out to be England. Think that over. All right. So here we are in the Garden of Eden. You know what he does? He disobeys dad. Figure it out. Right. So there we get the fall of man. And he later on in the novel says, that was my original fall. That was my original sin. OK, we get the idea. You know, Defoe lays it on a little bit heavy. Right? But remember, the novel is kind of a new thing in 1719. They haven't worked out all the, the kind, of, uh, kind of finesses. And this is not a novel, a novel loaded with finesse. If he says anything once, he says it 20 times. And if he symbolizes anything once, he symbolizes it again and again and again. And they're kind of heavy-handed symbols. Well, he goes to sea. And the first thing happens, God warns him. Not God as his father, but God as real God, capital G. And there's a terrible storm. And the sailor, who, or the captain of the ship, says, this is a providential warning from God. Do not go to sea. So, of course, Robinson Crusoe goes back on land and immediately finds another ship so he can go to sea. Why? Stubborn, satanic pride, insistence on having his own way, willfulness in the face of God's or, you know, uh, demands, things like that. Essentially, sin. Right? I mean, for, to put it really simply, sin. All the things that Crusoe does in the first part of the novel are sin, or almost all of them. And he has the, ch the appropriate chastisement for his sins by getting shipwrecked, comes to know that, comes to repent his sins, and amazingly enough, he's saved. The allegory is quite transparent. So he goes to sea, and what does he do? Well, he decides that he's going to trade on the coast of Africa. Why? Because he wants to accumulate things. He'd like to take advantage of the ignorant savages and give them trinkets and you know, gold, uh, beads and things like that and get back gold dust. He is an acquisitive figure. He lives in order to consume things. So he goes out and makes several trips to Africa, makes a ton of money, makes a great deal of money, and says, well, if I made a lot of money last trip, I better make another trip really quickly so I can make even more money. He is caught up with the idea, uh, if you know uh, Karl Marx's book, Capital MCM, he starts out with money, he turns it into a commodity, he sells the commodity, and then he has more money. Well, he keeps on doing that, and he lives in order to produce money, to accumulate wealth. He doesn't accumulate a tremendous amount of wealth, he accumulates nearly enough to get to the station in life, that middling station in life that his father had suggested, which shows you the vanity and futility of going against both God, the, or, uh, the, the demands of God and his father. But, of course, just when he's getting to that middling stage in life, which his father had told him to pursue, then tragedy or evil strikes. He is captured by Muslim pirates. Now, note the connection between Muslim and pirate. Right? I mean, it's just not just any old Muslims, it's Muslim pirates. Christian pirates know that that wouldn't fit into the overall scheme of this novel. I mean, that, that'd make them all uncomfortable. So we got Muslim pirates. They enslave him, naturally enough, that being what Muslim pirates do. I mean, it's one of the most ethnocentric novels imaginable. So they enslave him, but clever, reasonable Robinson Crusoe figures out how to get away. Uh, the Muslims send him out, foolish Muslims that they are, send him out to do a little fishing in a boat with guns and water and food, which shows just how gullible Muslim pirates are. Well, after doing that, he happens to have a slave boy in the boat with him, and 
His name is Zuri, and he says, hey, Zuri, you know, we're out of here. I mean, <laughs> we are, they let us out, and we're going into deep water. We're gone. So he manages to coast up and down uh, the, African, the coast of Western Africa. And of course, what does he meet there? Savages. Some of them are good savages, the kind that just give you food for nothing. Right? and are amazed at the fact that you have gunpowder and stuff like that. And some of them are bad savages, and they're all cannibals, and they need to be killed. But there aren't enough of us to kill them, so we just better get out of their way, which is what he does. Moves up and down the coast of Africa, and he's eventually rescued by a Portuguese mariner. A good man, even though he is a Catholic, there's a certain kind of a religious la uh, religiously uh, tolerant view, or at least within the Christian religions, there's a certain degree of tolerance advocated in this book. And he, he's picked up by a Portuguese mariner and says, look, I'm going to Brazil. You want to come? And since they're in the middle of nowhere and they're going to die, he says, sure, I'll go. <laughs> so now what does he do? What does a Crusoe do? Well, he says, for the, for, you know, in the first case, I'd like to pay you for my passage across, because he's a good kind of businessman. And look, you pay, you know, you take, you owe, you got to pay. And the captain is a very kind-hearted and kind of Christian man, says, no, I won't take any money. But I would like to buy Zuri from you who's now your slave, and he sells him. <laughs> and he says, well, I have some qualms about this. Ah, shucks, you know, I mean, the kid really doesn't belong to me. I used to be a slave. I know how bad it is. I, I'll tell you what, I'll just sell him to you as an indentured servant for 10 years. How about that? And Zuri, being a good savage, capital G, capital S, says, yeah, I really want to be a slave. He says, yeah, please enslave me. I would like to work for this guy for 10 years without getting paid. <laughs> and we're very accommodating savages in this novel. Um, so what do we get? These guys, go to, they go to Brazil, Zuri is enslaved, and you know what, once he gets to Brazil, he starts a plantation, and because he's a diligent, hard-working, prudent kind of a guy, he makes a ton of money. But since he's living in a Catholic province, he has to move from the Protestantism that he had, in a shallow way, been a part of in England, to Catholicism. But he, at this point, he's not especially religious, rather markedly irreligious, plays, pays lip service religion. He says, look, one, religion is, one Christian religion is as good as another. Here I am making a ton of money. I'm not leaving Brazil just because I happen to have a different brand of Christianity. I'm staying here and you know, I'll, I'll pray to anything as long as, it, as long as it pays. And you know what he wishes? He says, he has some qualms and he says, you know, I really wish that I hadn't sold Zuri. Not, as you might guess, because it's a cruel thing to sell someone into slavery that you don't even own, but rather, you know, I could do, I'd get a lot more work done here and I could make a tremendous amount more money if I had somebody that would be willing to work, for, or that uh, would be coerced to work for me. Entirely cold and unemotional, he has an entirely uh, instrumental conception of other human beings. He uses them for his purposes. They are not ends in themselves, right? He, he violates what Kant would call the categorical imperative. He doesn't use them as ends in themselves. He uses them as instruments by which to satisfy his own desires. Think about how Western Europeans related to the rest of the world. There we go. So he's there, and he's working real hard because he's a good, diligent Englishman at the height of the Enlightenment, coasting along on the, the wave of commercial capitalism. and. Some of, his, some of the planters around his area in Brazil come to him and say, you know, we know that you have some experience at sea. We know that you have some experience trading in Africa. Tell you what, we'll fund the cost of a, of a, of a slave expedition to Africa. You go to Africa and you get a bunch of slaves for us. We're not going to be too choosy about the means. We're not going to ask any questions. You bring them back and we'll give you your slice of the pie without any capital. And he says, wow, I get labor without putting in any capital? Oh my, I'm an enlightenment man. I'm immediately going to go. So he says, sure, get the boat together, get the crew together. Let's go to Africa and enslave people. What a charming guy. Remember, this guy is just out of slavery. He knows what it's like to be unjustly oppressed. Does it slow him down? No, immediately he says, fine, I want all I can get. Send, send us to Africa. We're going to bring back a bunch of slaves. I get my slice of the pie. We're all going to make a ton of money. Yeah. The only difficulty is, is that God is watching. And God doesn't care for this. So what's God going to providentially do? Shipwreck them. And where does he shipwreck them? Well, in a completely deserted place so that we can find ourselves in the state of nature. Now, all of Enlightenment political theory revolves around the concept of natural man in the state of nature. And what do we get here? We get unnatural man in the state of nature who is going to turn natural, be naturalized by his expulsion from society, forced to get down to human basics again, and then reconstruct the entire history of Western culture. In other words, ontogeny is going to recapitulate phylogeny. Rock and roll. I mean, this, is, this, this argument dovetails beautifully. Now, we send him out there. Now, notice that the other people on the, on the boat, they get killed. Right? They're all drowned, and he doesn't have anybody else with him. And one of the problems we see there is that, well, God must have his inscrutable reasons. They had to be killed. He had to be saved. We'll find out later on that he th attaches some sort of providential interpretation to this, which is what you would expect from somebody like Robinson Crusoe, who thinks on the one hand that he's sinful, but also that he's one of God's chosen. 
right? He's still alive. What does he do when he gets to the island? Well, first thing he does is say, oh my God, what a mess this is. Next thing he does is the sensible and intelligent thing. He gets everything he possibly can off the wreck, which is the only smart way to handle that. It'll take him a long time to manufacture his own guns and his own gunpowder and his own ironwork and things like that. So he takes all that off. And over the next 20 odd, I think it's 28 years that he spends on the island, he goes through all the phases of the development of civilization out of the state of nature. He starts hunting, right, hunting and gathering. Why? Because that's the beginning of, of, of culture. What happens next? They start to, he starts to domesticate plants and start to grow things and domesticate animals because he says he's, he's constantly being prudent and wondering, wow, I only have 20 years worth of powder here. I want to make sure that I conserve it. I only have about 40 gallons of liquor. I want to make sure that I only have a, a half an ounce every year. In other words, if I were there, I would certainly pour myself a stiff drink and have to think the problem over. <laughs> when he is rescued 28 years later, most of the booze is still there. Why? Because he's a good, prudent, diligent kind of a guy. Still there. Well, okay. He's remorselessly acquisitive. He's very calculating. He's an extremely I mean, an extreme epitome of the ruthlessly rationalistic manipulator of nature, characteristic of the Enlightenment. He goes through all the phases of culture, and then, of course, he encounters the other, capital O. And in, fo in the form of a very f a famous pa uh, passage where he finds a naked footprint right, on the sand. Now, it turns out not to be Friday's footprint. It's just some anonymous savage. But for now, I mean, the safe thing to assume is that all savages are bad savages, and of course, you know what that means. They have to be killed, or they'll kill you, they'll eat you, something along those lines. So, he encounters these natural, perverse creatures, these savages, and he hides, of course, and is very prudent and diligent, and constantly banks his fires to make sure that they don't notice him, and he's so, so careful. Well, he eventually can't avoid a contact with them. And he sees that they have two captives that they are going to eat, which is, remember, what savages do. Savages are all cannibals, except, of course, and even the, even the ones that are good savages have to be weaned away from cannibalism. But all savages, I mean, in other words, all people that aren't Westerners are essentially cannibals, the lowest possible stratum of human existence. Now, he rescues Friday. Friday runs away. People pursue him, and he kills him and manages to spirit Friday away. And of course, what does Friday do? Gets down on his knees, worships him, says, I'll forever be your slave. He's a good savage. A good savage is somebody that immediately says, well, you're the, the best thing in the world. You are the, 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 uh, the kind of acme of human development. And I would certainly like to voluntarily be your slave. I owe you my life. Now, what this harks back to, incidentally, those of you who know uh, John Locke's second discourse on government, uh, about, I don't know, 17, uh, 1690 or so, he makes a defense of slavery. He said, look, slaves taken in war, as an alternative to killing them immediately, can legitim people taken in war can legitimately be enslaved. What is he doing? Reflecting the main trends in Enlightenment political thought here. Right? Say it's a kind of Hobbesian relationship. Uh, Hobbes likes the idea of slavery, too, that you give to captives in war. Remember, we're all in the state of nature, which means the state of war. And if I spare somebody out of my munificence, well, OK, then he has to be my slave. That makes sense. It's a kind of natural law interpretation, which always turns out to favor the European. Next thing that happens, more, more savages come back, as you would expect. And this time they have a Spaniard who had been shipwrecked on another part of the main continent. And they also have, as fate would turn out, Friday's father. Now, one of the problems with this novel is there are a few too many easy coincidences. Remember, the novel hasn't been worked through very thoroughly in 1719, so there are a few too many crudities in the plot. Uh, too many coincidences. I mean, lucky break. It happens to be Friday's dad. There are 10 million savages back there on the mainland. Who comes ashore as a prisoner is going to be killed but dad? Okay. And there's a part in which uh, he has, uh, uh, Crusoe has a dream which prefigures his relationship with Friday and the savages. That's a little dicey, too. But don't ask too much of the literary form. Remember, it's at its infancy at this point. If you think about what the allegory amounts to, though, I think you'll emerge with a kind of respect for this novel that you hadn't had before. So Dad and the Spaniard get rescued. They kill the savages. And now we have four people. And for the, in the first case, since Friday by now is not only a Christian, but a Protestant Christian, Crusoe decides that his society is going to have toleration of all Christian religion, of all religions, not just all Christian religions, because Friday's dad is naturally a pagan and a savage and believes in idols and all that sort of business. And what he's doing here, again, back to, uh, say, Locke's theory, uh, arguments about toleration, 
right? The evils of religious warfare, things like that. And it may also, I mean, to be honest, have something to do with a sort of indifference to doctrinal questions. Hey, look, look as, God, as long as God keeps providing barley, right, who cares about transubstantiation? What difference does that make? Barley is barley. Who cares about abstraction? It doesn't matter. Right? I mean, a very strange and peculiar conception of the deity. So they get together, and they decide they're going to build a big boat to get away. Sensible idea. Now here we have a plot twist. Thank God there's one. Well, right now, it's about the only plot twist in the whole novel. Fortunately, and again, one of those coincidences happens, there's a shipwreck, or not a shipwreck, but a, a, a band of mutineers comes to the island, and they're going to dispose of the captain and the ones who are loyal to the, to the mate, uh, to the captain, um, on the island and, and just maroon them. And then they're going to go off, and we assume they're going to be pirates and plunder and do all the things that pirates do in the Caribbean in the 18th century. Well, carefully, cleverly, rationally, Crusoe outfoxes them. He captures them when they come on shore looking for water. He eventually manages to get in contact with the captain, release the captain and the loyal crew members from bondage, bring them on secretly, quietly onto the boat, take control of the boat, and amazingly enough, he's rescued. Okay, so now we have, all, we have a way of getting home. He's been there 28 years, but he has thought a great deal about God's providence. He has a developed a sense of his own sinfulness, which he didn't have before. And naturally, once God is going, I mean, once he's developed an understanding of how he really relates to God, of the very peculiar God he worships, well, then God cuts him a break and sends go home now. A couple of things we're thinking about here. He leaves the captive, or the, uh, the mutineers on the island. He said, look, we can take you home to England, and they're all gonna hang, you're all going to hang, right? Because that's what we do with mutineers. On the other hand, since I was sent here for providential reasons, I can't see why God's providence wouldn't work in your case. There must be a reason why you're here. We'll give you a choice. You want to stay here? I've got a couple of nice houses. I, you know, I have tilled fields. I have domesticated goats. I've got all this great stuff. So we'll leave you guys here. Show a certain degree of Christian mercy. After all, you guys are Christians and are Europeans. And we'll leave you here. Okay? You deal with the savages. They're your problem. Right? But we'll cut you a break. We'll let you stay here. He goes home. And amazingly enough, here's the big break. Every, all his property, the property that is in Brazil, the property they had back in England, all that has multiplied enormously. Oh, I, I love the idea of interest. Isn't it great? And when you're away for 28 years and you can't touch the principal, compound interest kicks in. He's a capitalistic kind of a guy. So he comes home and he's hugely successful in everything he's undertaken. Isn't that amazing? And people thought he was dead, so they inherited his stuff, but when he turns up alive, they all give it back to him because they're all perfectly honest. They're Europeans, after all. And not only are they all perfectly honest, but they're all perfectly diligent, just like him, and they've made a fortune. Yeah, all right. I mean, it's, it's like that little happy ending that's tacked onto the book of Job. All right, all this bad stuff here. You, you, you learn what the deal is. Let's go. Now you're rich. And as, as a kind of afterthought, or, and then there's a, kind of, there's a kind of digressive part of the novel which doesn't really belong there, where they talk about uh, wolves and bears and the natural dangers that are, in, that are still in Europe at the time. But that should have been chucked out. I mean, the book needs an editor. But uh, I mean, given that, that difficulty, that kind of, difficult, uh, kind of crudity in the plot, um, he comes home, and then we've got about three pages left. So it's time for Crusoe to get married. I have children, requite everyone that's been nice to him and that's developed money for him and are taking care of his property. They all get their slice of the pie as well. I mean, he's a capitalistic kind of a guy. I mean, everybody deserves their big, you know, a bite of the big pie. So he gives that to them, and he says, you know what? I should get married. And he says, uh, you, you, let's get married. I mean, I, the woman doesn't get introduced or hardly introduced. She doesn't have any personality. And, th and then he says, well, I better go to sea again. Now, psychologically, this is not especially plausible. I get shipwrecked for 28 years. I'm not getting in a boat again. <laughs> I don't know about you. I mean, think about it. He says, well, hmm, now that I'm married, I think I'm going to leave, and, and I'm really rich, I think I'll go for an adventure. A damn fool thing to do if you think about it. But he goes back. His colony is flourishing. He is the, the owner of this colony, natural law, natural right. There were savages there before, but they don't have natural rights in quite the same sense that Europeans do. So it's his now. And the people there, the land belongs to him, and the people work for him, and he cuts them a slice of the pie, and of course he's making even more money. And then, then of course the book ends. Now there'll be a sequel to this. It's kind of return, I mean, they call it part two, but actually return of Crusoe, or not quite son of Crusoe, but you get the idea. I mean, if it were a movie, it would be just Crusoe part two, or Crusoe two, something like that. And there, uh, Friday finally dies. Now, it's very interesting. Uh, Charles Dickens, the English novelist, uh, was appalled by this novel. If you know the novels of Dickens, right, it's constantly about impoverished children that tug at your heartstrings and just break your heart with the sentimentality. I mean, it's a little too saccharine. 
but Dickens read this novel, and he said, in some ways it's quite moving and gripping, but I just can't figure out this guy Defoe. I mean, he's living, you know, after Defoe's dead. But he said, I looked at this, and I said, about that death of Friday in, the, in book two, it occupies about a paragraph. Friday gets sick, and then he dies. Well, let's move on, let's go make some more money. You know, Friday's Friday's no big deal. Dickens said, if I had written that passage about Friday's death, it would have been 10 times longer, and when I finished, there would not have been a dry eye in the house. <laughs> and he's absolutely right. The coldness that we see in Crusoe is, I think, mirrored in Defoe's depiction of, inter of human interactions. I mean, you get married, well, we got a paragraph, let's, let's get married, let's wrap things up. Friday's dead, well, let's kick him out and let's go make some more money. A very cold and unemotional treatment of the human condition. Now. I want to talk some, a little bit about the philosophical implications of this novel. He's riding the wave of the Enlightenment. He's right at the crest of it, Robin, uh, Defoe. Some of the things that come in. First of all, how about the labor theory of value? Right? Real important to English political economy goes all the way back to Locke, who introduces the idea of the labor theory of value. Crusoe, and this is one of the things that appalled Marx. What a rude guy uh, Robinson Crusoe is. Because he doesn't, want to, he doesn't want to squander anything or waste any of his, uh, of his effort and his activity, he keeps a ledger. Now, since you can't have an economy with just one person, you can't buy and sell from yourself, he keeps a ledger of what he does and how, long, how much time it takes to do it. In other words, the amount of labor that goes into a given activity is what the activity is worth. That's what the labor theory of value is. Go back and read Locke, the second, second treatise. Another idea. If you look at the ancient political tradition that goes back to Aristotle, Aristotle says that the minimal unit of society is the family. This flatly contradicts that. The reason why there are no women in this novel is because he's trying to suggest that the minimal unit of society is the atomized individual. That's why women are more or less superfluous. You don't have to reproduce. You by yourself are sufficient to be a whole society. Whereas anyone in the ancient and medieval political tradition would not have accepted that idea. That is a particular uh, an idea characteristic of the Enlightenment. We're going to atomize society down to its minimal unit. And the minimal unit is no longer the family. Okay. His experiences on the island, in a kind of uncanny way, reflect the alienation and loneliness of the bourgeois individual, of the ego that exists only in order to consume things and in order to get a new angle on how to make money that has very little in the way of emotional or ties or ties to a community. He is a community. What does he need to be tied to anybody for? He can actually recapitulate the entire history of Western, of the, of Western development. And my favorite passage of this book, and I can't help but read you a little bit, is theodicy. Uh, it's, it's really heartwarming. Crusoe's idea of theodicy involves double-entry bookkeeping, which is what you would think of a kind of commercial kind of a thinker. Um, he says at one point, uh, why am I here? What's going on here? So he actually makes up a list. He says, here's the good things about being here, and here's the bad things. Let's see how God comes out. Point number one, evil. I'm cast upon a horrible, desolate island, void of all hope of recovery. On the other hand, good. But I am alive, and not drowned as all my ship's company was. Under evil, I'm singled out and separated, as it were, from all the world to be miserable. Good. But I'm singled out, too, from all the ship's crew to be spared from death. And he that miraculously saved me from death can deliver me from this condition. I have no clothes to cover me. He says, look, where, God, come on, quick, 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 where are the clothes? But I am, oops. But I am, in a hot, I am in a hot climate where if I had clothes, I could hardly wear them, right? I had to put them away somewhere, and I could sell them when I finally get, a, get away from here. In other words, there's a long list of things. He says, well, here's the good things God, have done, God has done for me. Here's the bad things God has done for me. He gets down to the bottom line. He does the, the mathematics, and it turns out that God is in the black. God has been doing good stuff from, and that's theodicy. There's God's rev revelation of his plan to the world. What a crass and materialistic interpretation. You can see why Marx hated this. And in some respects, it's not entirely clear why Rousseau liked it so much, or at least that, part, uh, that passage, anyway. Now, the problem of theodicy is dealt with quite extensively in the course of the book, and it's not just in the form of double-entry bookkeeping. Friday is having Christianity explained to him, and he says, in his usual kind of garbled version of English, so, uh, since God is all-powerful and the devil is really bad, how come God just doesn't kill him? As a matter of fact, why hasn't he killed him a long time ago? And Crusoe first, asks, first is puzzled and doesn't want to seem puzzled because he's a European. So, he acts like he doesn't hear it, right? Which is kind of evasive and kind of unpleasant response. And so, Friday re repeats the question. He says, look, why doesn't God, you tell me that God is there and that this bad stuff happens, so why doesn't God just eliminate the bad stuff? What's going on? 
Crusoe says, look, I'll explain it to you some other time. Uh, look, it all works out in the end. Trust me about this. In other words, he doesn't know. Right? He can give you certain explanations. He can try and be like Job's friends. Right? You think, oh, yeah, I understand this. But in fact, he doesn't. So he can't quite respond to the fair and completely legitimate questions that Friday offers. Now, let me conclude by thinking a little bit about uh, the overall significance of this novel. One way of thinking about it would be that here we have the, the man of the Enlightenment epitomized right, and shown in his relationship to nature, which is the, and the domination of nature is a foundational element in the Enlightenment project, and in his domination of the rest of the world, and particularly the rest of the world's societies, and this is you know, at the bottom of the Enlightenment. We might also want to think a little bit, I mean, to move away from the novel a little bit, about our own condition and how we relate to, to this novel. It's often seemed to me that the image of Crusoe's wrecked ship tells us, or at least hints to us certain things about our relationship to biblical religion. I know that may sound like a, like a big jump, but I don't think it is. We live now in an age in which we, in some respects, have been cast amidst a, de a desolate nature, in which it's harder and harder for biblical religion to be taken seriously by the professorial, or the kind of the intellectuals of our culture. And yet, we relate to this tradition of biblical religion, in some respects the way Crusoe related to the hulk of his ship, even though the ship is grounded on a reef and will never sail again, there are many things of enormous value here that might well be stripped off before we let it go. These things have taken an age to accumulate and represent the representative wisdom of the entire Western tradition in many respects. And we ignore that and kind of waste that at our peril. That is one of the possible morals to take from this. And uh, it's the most arresting image of the, in the novel. So it's not only a, an important statement about the culture of the Enlightenment, it may well tell us something about the world in which we live.